So, hello everyone. Um, thank you for coming to this panel. Um, you've, re you've reached m m maximum capacity. I mean, that's where you are. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm Helen Margitz. I'm going to chair this panel. Um, I'm a professor at the, uh, at the University of Oxford. And uh, I'm going to give a short introduction to the, the panel, and then my fellow panelists are going to um, also give an introduction to their views on the topic. And then we're going to have a discussion, and then we're going to invite you also to have a discussion. But before we do that, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce my fellow panelists in the order which they're going to speak. Um, the first is Martha Dark. Martha is co-founder and director of Foxglove, a UK-based non-profit that investigates, litigates, and campaigns on issues concerning technology and social justice. Martha was previously chief operating officer at the Open Rights Group, and before that, head of operations for the human rights charity, Reprieve. Um, Gabriel Stemmer is an editor, director, and literature graduate who uses the internet's large archive box as a playground and research field. She has directed several short films and recently finished a web series for art, Women Under Algorithms, to be aired in 2023, so soon. Um, she collaborated as an editor with Bertrand Bonello uh, from Coma and Celine Duvo, Everyone Loves Jean. And uh, then Guillaume Poir, uh, who is the author of several plays uh, performed in France and abroad. He's a former student at the École Normale Supérieure. He published a highly acclaimed first novel in 2017, Les Fils Conducteurs, um, which won the Weple Fondation La Poste Prize in 2017 and 2019. Um, and also, he was just awarded, uh, very recently, um, the Grand Prix de la Fiction ra Radiophonique by la Société des Auteurs for Soudan. Um, so congratulations on that, because I think that was very recent. Um, yeah, so um, I wanted to introduce the topic, um, you've reached ma maximum capacity, and kind of frame it a little bit. Um, and I thought I'd do that, um, I'm, I, I'm research and write about the relationship between te technology and politics. Um, and a few years ago, I wrote a book called Political Turbulence, How Social Media Shape Collective Action. And um, so I'm actually going to start by saying something kind of positive about the, the digital world and particularly um, social media, um, because I suspect that as the discussion progresses, um, we'll be saying quite a few negative things. So I thought I would start for something positive, but don't get horrified, because sometimes the people are quite shocked if you say something positive about social media. Um, but anyway, that, that book, it was about how social media allow tiny acts of, of political participation liking something, following something, sharing something, um, some kind of information or, or, or participatory act, like signing a petition or something. Because politics used to be, in the pre-digital era, um, really lumpy. It, it, you had to do something kind of, you had to expend a lot of time or, or resources in some way to participate in politics. You had to tramp the streets or go to a long, potentially boring meeting. Um, as Oscar Wilde put it, the trouble with socialism is that it does cut so fearfully into the evenings. Basically though, tiny acts of participation mean that somebody with no more resources than a mobile phone can contribute to some mobilization to fight injustice or, or to some community building, or some kind of exercise where everybody's contributing a little. You can do something small, but it might scale up to something big. And of course, there's no country in the world where it hasn't scaled up um, uh, to something, something big. And 
in some ways, that started to look like some kind of democratic renewal. More people are doing more things in the political realm. Um, and with, 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 with the aim of doing something for the common or the, or the collective good. So because people quite often try to blame or, or, or tend to blame social media for all kinds of bad things, particularly in politics, I wanted, um, and, 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 and many bad things do happen in online environments, and I think we're all working on that from some angle, but I did want to start um, with that positive note. Anyway, turning to the title of our discussion, you've reached maximum capacity, and this question of whether we should limit interconnectivity. Now, I would argue that to make a distinction between um, the digital realm and the kind of real world, you could argue that it do no longer makes an, any sense, particularly after the pandemic. Our daily lives are completely intertwined with digital platforms and technologies of all kinds. So in a way, to ask whether we should limit our interconnectivity is to ask if we should limit life itself um, I think, uh, and, and, and we can discuss that. But there are many things that we can and should do to kind of smooth the path of our digital lives, foster creativity and innovation, um, as, as my fellow panelists are doing, and kind of tame the huge platforms that shape our behavior, or as Zadie Smith put it in the first section, structure our very thoughts. We need to think and understand about how, that, how these, these platforms shape our lives. I just talked about political turbulence. Actually, digital platforms are, are, are fostering turbulence of all kinds, social turbulence, economic turbulence. Um, and our institutions have failed to keep up with that. Um, there's a real need for institutions to develop the kind of expertise to, 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 to manage and, and keep up with the digital world. I know that Martha is going to talk about the work of Foxglove in holding the social media giants to account um, in terms of their failure to kind of keep us safe in, in, in the digital world, to keep either users of the platforms or indeed workers on the platforms um, safe. AR technologies can reinforce organizational tendencies like bias, um, and also stereotypes, and Gabrielle is going to talk about how social media can become a kind of straitjacket um, for, for women. Our institutions of governance and regulation really struggle um, to, to limit transformed markets or to predict or to respond to mobilizations that rise up seemingly from nowhere, and we, again, we've seen that all over the world. And there are all sorts of ways that the digital realm emerges to actually damage the physical world. Um, that goes from the digital, um, uh, the, the digital rubbish tips, if you like, that Guillaume will talk about, to the quite horrifying potential environmental effects of, of the large language models like ChatGPT, which many of us are excited about, but also tremendously worried about. Just to finish, I mean, we, we should remember, though, that what we see online is, is in part the digital technology holding up a mirror for us. Society's always been plagued by hate extremism, misinformation, and homophily. In a way, there's nothing new under the sun in terms of how badly we can behave or humans can behave. Lots of, of hiring, from hiring to policing, lots of our processes have been, have been biased. Um, humans are biased. We, 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 we are all biased in some way. So we must take advantage of the data and the digital insight that kind of reveals these tendencies and gives us a chance to improve, to improve our systems of governance, to look at them afresh and to improve them. Um, and I hope we'll talk a bit about that as well. But anyway, um, now I shall hand over to Martha. Thanks. Hi, I'm Martha. 
Um, after that positive introduction, I'm afraid that mine might not be quite so positive, but I'll try. Uh, I'm going to talk about social media, uh, particularly Facebook, um, and some of the consequences of the uh, way that Facebook operates in the world, both on users of Facebook and both platform workers who um, work to keep the platform safe from hateful content and harmful content for the rest of us. Um, but I wanted to start with a story, actually, which I think demonstrates uh, quite well one of the points I wanted to make, which is also the focus of a constitutional case in the Kenyan courts that my organization, Fox Club, is supporting at the moment. Um, and it's an example of Facebook's business model uh, helping to spread viral hate in the context of the Ethiopian civil war, or the Ethiopian war. And so just over a year ago, a respected chemistry professor at an Ethiopian university, Professor Marig, was brutally murdered outside of his home. And he was murdered outside of his home after two racist posts were posted on Facebook. And the posts published photographs of his home and his address and his picture. And how the people that murdered him knew where he was was as a result of that Facebook post. And indeed, Facebook failed to remove that post and it was widely shared. And this was despite multiple requests from his son, who's now one of the petitioners in the case, asking them to repeatedly remove the post. Um, and as I said, this is in the context of a war, and it reportedly 600,000 people have died in the context of that war. And Facebook's algorithms and the way that Facebook operates have played a role. And the, I mean, unfortunately, the example that I'm giving in Ethiopia isn't specific to Ethiopia. This is a problem that we've seen time and time again in multiple different countries across the world. From Myanmar, it was widely reported uh, the, the, the role that Facebook played in Myanmar and India, and indeed in the US Capitol attacks uh, on January 6th. Um, and just, I mean, many of you probably already know the way that Facebook works, but in case it's useful to explain sort of how this happens, Facebook's business model is obviously dependent on eyes on screens because eyes on screens means more uh, advertisers paying for those eyes on those screens. And the content that unfortunately is viral, goes viral, is often the most outrageous content and sometimes some of the worst content. And so amplifying that material can mean more eyes on screens for longer and therefore more advertising revenue for the company. And some of you might remember um, Francis Haugen, the, the Facebook whistleblower, who very bravely uh, talked about and disclosed lots of documents about the way that Facebook works behind the scenes. And she disclosed two things that I think are really relevant and interesting to what I'm talking about. And the first is that um, during the Capitol riots on January 6th, um, the, the, the company managed to implement these measures called the break the glass measures, which can be implemented in a couple of hours, and they really dim down the amount of hate that's you know circulating around the platform. And so we know that Facebook can do that, but it's just choosing not to in the context of the war in Ethiopia because it's putting uh, profit over uh, safety of users. Um, and the second thing that Francis told the world is that Facebook knows the extent of the harm that it's causing, particularly in the non-English speaking world, uh, but fails to act time and time again. Um, and so, the, as I mentioned, the, the, petition, the petitioners, uh, or sorry, the person who has murdered son is bringing this case along with an Amnesty International researcher uh, who's sadly unable to return to Ethiopia because of the hate that he received online. Um, but I should add, I think, as well as the kind of algorithms playing a role, um, one of the sort of lesser talked about, I think, pieces of keeping the platform safe for users is the work that Facebook content moderators do around the world. And I think if you follow Mark Zuckerberg's tours of Congress, you would hope, or he would hope that we would believe that it's the AI that keeps the platform free from beheadings and child pornography and all sorts of other awful things that are uploaded to the internet or to Facebook. But it's a, it's an, it's a group of 15,000 people around the world, many of whom suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder because of the awful, uh, violent, often, content that they're reviewing day in, day out with uh, really insignificant or really like significantly failing mental health care. 
Um, and so I think, you know, I, I think we talk, or a lot in the media recently, is about the harm that we, that many users, particularly there's been a lot of attention, I think, around, you know, the harm that some platforms have done to uh, teenage girls, for example, if you think about Molly Russell in the UK. Um, and I think there's been, you know, this is changing, but the, the kind of behind the scenes role and the harm that the way that the platform operates and the decisions by Facebook have on those whose job it is to moderate the platform. But to come back to the broader topic, and I think I'm probably nearing my five minutes, but um, I think the key question, one of the key questions that you put to us at the beginning, or that's the focus of this, is should the impact that we're, should, should we be limiting our connectivity and limiting the way that we engage with the digital, and I would agree with what you said, Helen, in terms of that being a slightly impossible task now. Um, but I would say that that's the wrong question, and it shouldn't be that we should be seeking to disengage or seeking to um, not use social media in the same way. Um, I think the question should be rather, what should, social, what, sh what should social media companies be doing to make the online space a, sa a, a place that is safe for both workers and for users? And so, you know, I, I don't think we should be getting rid of our Facebook accounts. I think we should be thinking through, and indeed many brilliant genius academics and lawyers are and people across the world, but I think we should be thinking about, and you mentioned regulation, Helen, what should be in place to ensure that some of the richest companies on the planet uh, are accountable to users and to, to workers. Um, and just to sort of, to close, I think um, it's a real myth that social media is free. Uh, it is a, it is the way, you know, it's the way that we communicate, it's the way that we consume news, and in doing so, we hand over some of most uh, some of our most intimate and personal detail information in exchange for access to that and like i said these are some of the richest companies on the planet and these companies have a duty to behave better and produce and create a social media that is better for all of us so i suppose that's a slightly positive note to end on but not really <laughs> thank you for trying <laughs> gabrielle hi uh, everyone um on a totally different note, <laughs> I will talk about um, YouTube and uh, Instagram and uh, more especially what uh, my um, one of the movies that was uh, screening tonight was about, which is uh, cleaning videos on YouTube. Um, and actually, um, uh, so I, I, I directed uh, several short movies which are all related to um, internet and uh, the use that we make of it as a place next to the real world and how we can um, build uh, other spaces inside um, the world through internet. So more, more specifically, um, I, I myself in the way that I uh, treat um, no, no, that I uh, consider the internet is like um, archives of today, and uh, I make movie like I think that there's um, uh, uh, a word for that, which is now net fan footage. So it's like the fan footage of the internet, and this is the the, um, the archives that I, I use in my practice and. Um, in that sense, to me, uh, if you look uh, at the internet and social media and all the content that arrive uh, every day, every second in our lives, if you look uh, inside specific little bubbles, you can really recreate uh, different uh, lives of people. And in that sense, I love the internet and I love social medias because it's like uh, hundreds of uh, windows that I can uh, have a, a peek in, inside the windows and this is how I consider this uh, material. So, um, and actually, if I try to find a connection between, uh, between our different approaches to, to the internet, I would... Um, so I would have to talk about uh, this movie specifically, but I, I, I 
I, I don't think that everybody has seen it, so I will just um, uh, precise. It's a, so it's a movie about a certain type of videos on YouTube, which are cleaning videos. So it's a, a phenomenon where women uh, all over the world, but the beginning was um, uh, in America. So it was American housewives who started filming themselves while cleaning their homes. And, uh, and put it that on YouTube. And it's actually a very big uh, YouTube world, among others. And uh, you can see um, there are a million views uh, on these videos. And it's actually started to be a business. And so it's all the ramification that it um, contains. And, but uh, the, the movie that I made, so Clean With Me After Dark, it's uh, the title. It starts with... Um, the, the the presentation of these videos and the first reaction that we might have uh, could be uh, well internet is full of crap what is this uh, I wh who are these women and stuff like that but when the movie um, progress progresses um, I try to um, uh, I don't know how to say that in English to uh, faire un pas de côté <laughs> uh, to to look from another perspective on these videos. So through the editing, I, for instance, uh, change the sounds and uh, the speed of the videos. And what I wanted to, to, the point that I was trying to make was to listen to what these women were saying inside the videos or outside these videos, but in other videos in their accounts, in their, channel, in their channels, and um, which reveals um, uh, a very big loneliness and uh, through the internet and through these videos and other uh, accounts that they create like on, on Instagram for instance they really build a, a place for them for themselves together as a support system to um, to live a better life than the life that they have that they used to have uh, alone in their little homes. And uh, in that sense, I would say that um, uh, to me, uh, from a documentary point of view, the internet is a really big uh, uh, box of archives that uh, can um, help us to, to, to listen to voices that we are not used to listen to. So. For instance, uh, they speak a lot about um, motherhood, but through um, difficulties. So most of them I discovered were suffering from depression. And um, uh, as I was making the movies, I discovered that a lot of them were uh, military wives. And so there was a whole uh, uh, new world that was um, coming from, from, from these videos, which in the beginning were just uh, cleaning videos on YouTube. Um, and uh, and so in that sense, uh, actually, there's a um, uh, there's a sentence from um, Simone de Beauvoir in in the deuxième sex, which she said that women are comrades uh, of um, of jail, and that um, no, uh, they are ca comrades of captivity, and together they help each other um, bearing their jail. And I would say that it's exactly what it's uh, in these videos in, in YouTube and in the community on Instagram. I talk about female community here, but um, where you can see that through the social medias and their accounts, they are trying to, to help uh, one another and uh, to um, express stuff that are used to be repressed. So it's a big support system that is taking place and new voices are emerging through that. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Guillaume. I'm gonna, I, I can tell a story because uh, I'm a novelist, so that's what I'm used to do. And um, there are the images you, you will see are um, the images that um, are in, in in the, this is the origin of the writing of my first novel, so Les Fils Conducteurs, that could be, you know, the, the electrical wires you have in the devices, in the electronical devices. And I was, it was 10 years ago in 2013, I was in Stockholm, you know, with the easy jet generation, like flying from one capital to another, being totally unconscious of what we, we've experienced all through the night here with the climate crisis. 
and I was uh, going to the amazing uh, Fotografiska Museum, and it was an amazing place, and I saw there was this series of photography by Peter Hugo, and he's a South African um, photograph, photographer, sorry, and uh, the, the series was called Permanent Error, and it, so the, the, the photographs show the workers in the electric, e electronical dump site in Agbogbloshi in Ghana, and I had never heard about this location before. I was totally ignorant, and I, I was really shocked because the images were absolutely dramatic and very, very moving and very uh, spectacular in a sense. And so I had a kind of epiphany when I saw the, the, the series, uh, but a, a, a very problematic epiphany, <laughs> um, a very ethical, uh, which rose many ethical problems in the position I was occupying at the moment as a, you know, just someone, a, a young man, uh, a white young man in, born in France and, you know, just traveling around. And uh, the, um, what is very striking to me with these pictures and writing the novel kind of taught me um, what, what I, why I was shocked by the pictures. It's uh, the pictures show the ruins of capitalism, of what is the, what, what's the situation we're living in today. And I had absolutely no idea that all the electronic devices were ending up somewhere at the other point of the globe. I had no idea what I had done with my own devices. Like, my, like I was 25, I probably have had uh, like four or five cell phones, smartphones, two computers maybe, and I, had n I couldn't imagine where I had throw them away. So I was very shocked by my behavior, by my ignorance. And I found that there was a very a modern paradox in this, uh, in this location, because the, the dump site is usually a place that is disgusting, where we, we put all the waste and everything we want to get rid of. And here, the, the, the waste was made of our most valuable objects, the one that, uh, you know, we can't live without them. They, they um, regulate our lives, our intimacies. And I was very, very impressed by, by that. And um, I must say also that there was um, a very problematic uh, issues while watching the, f the, photogra the photos was that they were very beautiful. There was an aesthetical, um, um, you know, there was, there was something that, that was very striking. There was something with beauty and I found it very shocking. I was shocked by the beauty I could find in this disaster and this apocalyptic phot photos. So I was wondering why do I find apocalypse um, desire, de uh, desirable in a sense and why do these images reveal something that I can you know, I'm I'm shocked, but in a sense, I'm appealed to the uh, to the pictures, and so that's why I decided to write a novel to uh, try to um, first of all document myself on the electronical waste system because it's a whole system. Of course, the the it it takes place in Ghana. So I mean, when I say of course, I mean it's, it takes place in a previous colony. Um, it's uh, so Ghana was a, a previous uh, UK colony. I'm really giving no lessons because, as a French, I, I think France has no lessons to give to you know any any other democracy. Um, and I was thinking, why do these uh, dump sites don't um, happen in Europe, for example? And of course, uh, problematics of neo-colonialism came very, very fast in the reflection. So I decided, because as a literary point of view, the only thing I could do was, of course, to talk and document the reader about what was happening in Ghana, and also trying to find a literary perspective to talk about a uh, um, dump site, and to try to find a modern way of talking about this topic, which is, of course, very crucial today. And so I tried to talk about what the writer, the sorry, the workers do there, because the workers are, 
you know, uh, th they work, of course, in um, in very severe sanitary conditions. So uh, they're they're um, teenagers. So it's usually teenagers from 10 to 15 years old who work there. They try to, you know, uh, so get the the electronic device, uh, the electronic um, uh, thread. I don't know if it's, it's the correct word to resell them. So there is a whole economy. Uh, and of course, to get the metal, they burn the the plastic um, uh, the plastic uh, thing rolling, <laughs> yeah. And uh, the, the the fumes are very toxic, and so there is a whole contamination of the bodies, of the soil, uh, as well. And I was like, of course, like the modern uh, Western world is contaminating a land and bodies, and it's it has to do with the capitalistic history we're all, you know, uh, inheriting now. So, um, maybe I can finish there, but the, um, uh, writing the novel kind of made me understand that we think the, our lives are dematerialized, that we live in a digital uh, and material world where th the devices are more and more aesthetics and more and more light and more and more invisible but here is the here are the objects and here is the the true um uh, poison that we use every day as you know our way of regulating our our lives so i think we we collectively need to think about do we want more and more uh, version of iPhones and uh, do we really need to uh, to um, you know change our tools very as often but in a sense how can we not be trapped by the great uh, companies uh, with all the you know uh, you've reached maximum capacity you need more storage you need a better a better um, a better tool to inf uh, to perform better so it's uh, it's uh, I think it's a paradox um, we're living in now, and I have no lessons to give to anyone because I'm trapped as we are all in this in this uh, in this enigma. How do we how do we regulate our use of the, of these technologies in order to just you know uh, be able to survive uh, <laughs> as a as a common people? Thank you, and you've really illustrated the kind of vicious circle that I guess we're, we've all been talking about in a way, the, the, the fact that, uh, you know, these devices have built in ob obsolescence, um, but the story is always that you must have a more powerful advice to run more powerful algorithms, um, and, and it's kind of a, a, a circle which we, we don't necessarily need to be running around. I mean, I guess what we have to think about is how we kind of limit limit that circle and certainly both you and um, Martha have been talking about how it would have to be a story of how we how we limit the companies themselves um, uh, but 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 then there are some things which I mean you illustrated nicely that the kind of good and the bad I mean in, you know the sense of community the support that we get from social media and I mean, if you think of the pandemic, if you think of being locked down without any access to the digital world, what, what would that have really been like? I mean, uh, um, I, I, I think most of us, much as we, again, maybe complain about Zoom and all these platforms, I mean, they were what linked us with the social world. So it's always a question of this preserving the things that are good um, uh, while limiting the things that are so bad. I think that now we should move to um, to ask the audience to um, to join the discussion. Um, anybody got anything they want to ask or, or comment? Uh, <coughs> yes, good, good question. I mean, Martha, you alluded to it, and Helen, you mentioned it too. Uh, regulation. I mean, and uh, do we? I've been talking about the UK. Do we not regulate because the government is inept, which is very possible? Uh, the current one anyway, um, or what is it that these media companies, social media companies have over governments that they don't do anything about it? I mean, they don't pay tax. I mean, so it can't be that they're funding the treasury. 
Um, do they fund political parties without telling us? I mean, I don't know. Why don't they regulate? Simple question. Right. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I think I'd agree with potentially some of your views about um, the current government, but um, I, I would say um, this is a relatively new, this is relatively new. Technology has been around for some time, but not that long. And I think the growth and speed at which the companies have grown is huge. Like people compare their wealth and power to tobacco and to, um, and often people, people, people tell me, people ask me, why uh, aren't you using some of the, reg the approaches to encouraging regulation that was used when um, big like tobacco companies would be trying to be reined in? And my response to that is always, I think this is way harder than trying to rein in tobacco companies. Like everybody said here, the, the extent to which technology, technology permeates everything. And I think that, and also brings like amazing solutions too. So I think it's really difficult. But sorry, just in response to regulation, I think the UK, uh, there is, I think the Competition Markets Authority, the CMA in the UK, and competition uh, authorities across Europe have made really interesting steps to regulate big tech. And in, in, the UF, in the US, the Federal Trade Commission has really paved the way. There's this really amazing woman that's the head of the FTC called Lena Khan, who wrote this incredible university uh, doctor, uh, like um, thesis about um, why big tech should be broken up. And I would imagine it's not surprising to anyone here that I think big tech should be broken up and that they're indeed too powerful. But I think, um, we're slow to, to, to that in the UK and Europe, but the UK has begun to take really interesting steps. So there is re regulation being introduced. There's the online safety bill in the UK, which aims to rein in big tech. In Europe, there's other European regulation. Um, and just to briefly say on the CMA, one, I think one of the most interesting things that will rein in the power of big tech is moves like that made by the CMA recently when Facebook, as big as Facebook is, tried to buy the plat the GIF sharing platform, you know, Giphy, that one that you use for GIFs. Um, they tried to buy it. And for the first time, rather than, um, you know, making suggestions about small changes, they said, no, no, actually, you just can't buy them. Your monopoly power is too big, and unfortunately, you can't do that. So that's a long-winded answer, but I think the regulation is beginning to be there. But the size and um, power and lobbying power of, of the companies, um, I think, is tricky. It's also a question of kind of ex expertise and, and institute the, the sort of our governing institutions have so little expertise in this area. Um, they are now trying to acquire it, but that makes it hugely difficult um, for regulation. So it is this question of institutional catch up to, to some extent. But I should point to the EU because they have been um, uh, there is a uh, there are a range of um, legislation that have that have come and, and are coming in, in in the EU. They have really been leading leading the way in 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 a lot of ways. And I was I remember being at a meeting of lots of people from Silicon Valley uh, uh, at the time that GDPR was being talked about. And from the way they were talking, you would have thought the sky was about to fall in and, you know, if this was such a terrible thing. But, you know, guess what? Um, the sky didn't fall in. Um, and it, it illustrated the point that you can regulate. We tend to see technology as a sort of tide washing over us that we are, you know, we can't limit, we can't control. And I think we've got to stop thinking like that in a way and I think we all feel really hopeless when we see these 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 photographs and I, I, I think we have got to start thinking about yeah what we can do to limit it I'm sure there's another question I can't see very well uh, I'd like to top up on what uh, Martha said about uh, we need to regulate the uh, uh, big social media or big companies running so social medias uh, or the question, what can we do to make them make uh, the social media a safe place for, for everyone? And if we are thinking from another perspective, we could ask as well the question, so I'm asking you the question, how can we uh, entrust uh, the users uh, to build up their own social medias around um, self-managed communities uh, to take back the power? Uh, because regulating is still giving a lot of power uh, 
it's sort of these big, these big countries, these big um, companies have become sort of like countries or states that can negotiate with other states. Uh, as actually, some uh, countries have ambassadors to uh, the big fours. So, what can we do to take give back the power to the communities in terms of uh, regulation and self-management? Um, what can we do to make big tech behave? I mean, uh, this kind of connects the two questions a little bit, but one point that I would also make, I think, um, and going back to your point about regulators, the Information Commissioner's Office, like, I think lots of the regulators historically have been uh, imposing fines on big tech companies, and those fines are pocket change. Like even a multi-million dollar fine or even a billion dollar fine to the likes of Google mean nothing. And actually I think the change that we need to be pushing for um, is structural change. So indeed the case I mentioned earlier, that case isn't seeking, is, is, is seeking structural change to the way that Facebook systems work. Um, so I think that's, that's one point. But into, I guess your question is more how can we as users and members of the public um, work to uh, make big tech companies behave better and more fairly. Um, and I don't think I have anything radical or new in terms of my suggestions, but the things that I would encourage people to do um, are to engage local politicians in the UK. I think at the moment it's a particularly interesting time with the online safety bill and the current government. Um, and so I would encourage people to yeah engage their their politicians to not uh, disengage from social media um, and then the second th and and support cases like Abraham and and uh, Fisejos who are two individuals taking on one of the biggest companies on the planet and then just the second point of your of your question about kind of alternatives um, I think Elon Musk's like the Twitter bin fire that happened um, or is happening uh, pushed like a mass exodus from Twitter to Mastodon. And, and you know, sure, it's slightly more annoying. You have to host your own server and all sorts of things, create your own server and all sorts of things. But I think there are kind of interesting alternatives popping up. And also, I can't remember exactly what it was. Do you, maybe you remember, but do you remember when there was mass exodus from WhatsApp because they changed the terms to Signal and everybody left and moved to it? And that's privacy, not tech power. But, like, I think there are those moments of, like, big failures by big tech. So, you know... Elon and whatever Facebook's failure was, that, uh, sorry, WhatsApp's failure that I'm forgetting was, does push people to better alternatives. And because often, uh, and often those are open source and they may be a little bit more clunky, but I would, yeah, I certainly would encourage using them. Do you have any views on that, um, Gabriella or Guillaume? I mean, it, you know, the communities that you've been looking at, do, any way that they could be, I don't know, nudged in some way <laughs> to... Um, well, there's two two things. Uh, one is that um, what I observed and what I'm interested in in more that um, the way that you can use these uh, huge platforms to and hijack them a little bit, building something different than what they are intended to. So, for instance, a, a support group uh, inside of Instagram, which is not the first purpose of Instagram. Um, and the other thing is, the, like for instance, for YouTube, uh, there's actually among the clean the clean influencers, so the cl the influencers of cleaning, which is my thing, uh, you can see that uh, some of them are leaving YouTube to create then their own platforms, but as individuals. So it's like a website with a, but it's um, you have to pay if you want to watch the video. So it's a direct um, a cash that you have to. To, to give, not uh, just your data. But, uh, uh, and so they are, they are trying to escape the platforms, but I don't think that their intentions are particularly good. It's just that they want to make more money with their videos. Um, so, no, yeah, it would be more like how you can hijack the platforms to do your little thing uh, in, in your corner. Do you have any views? Yeah, uh, it, it, I, in, I, I'm not on the social media, so I, it's really like kind of a strange, um, strange word to me. A bit um, worrying in a sense because I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not initiated to this uh, world. But I think um, maybe it's also because I have a kid. I'm worrying about how how 
does that uh, invade our intimacy? How does that sell our intimacy? So I try to have a like a limit uh, for myself, but it's also because I, I tried to go on Facebook like five years ago, especially when I was releasing my first novel, and I was inevitably taken into narcissistic promotional issues with likes, who am I liking, who do I need to re-like and, and republish in order to be liked by him. And I, and I realized that I was um, kind of harassed by my own um, addiction to what it created in my mind. So I decided that I needed to quit because otherwise I would become very, you know, um, crazy. And uh, because I had, I didn't have the uh, cognitive uh, distance and uh, I don't know, uh, I, I couldn't help uh, going going and, and using it in, in, a, in a terrible way. Uh, so I think there is a whole spot of education to think, especially in schools and for the young generation using it much better than I do because I was born and uh, I grew up in the 90s and in the 90s internet was just starting so I'm, I'm not the proper generation to be able to, I think, in, in my own way to think about it, but I think there needs to be a, a huge uh, educational um, program that we need to ask with our, to our governments and to be sure that um, teachers and students at school and, and pupils are you know, taught how, how do you regulate yourself, uh, what do you post about yourself, what do you post about others, how do you use it. I think there is a whole, si a whole topic and the whole subject to think collectively for the for the generations to come. Thank you. Do, do we have time? No. <laughs> okay. But that's a nice way to end in a way because you've got you've got three solutions there. Um, you have the the sort of legal and the regulatory solution. You have the kind of community and 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 kind of social solution, and then you have the individual solution <laughs> of um, th thinking about it, uh, it or taking the. Or, or exit option so we should leave it there thanks so much everybody for coming thanks so much for the panel